Welcome back to the back porch of Franklin Bridge, where I'm greeted with the beautiful hole 18 here at Franklin Bridge. It's uh, me and Scott Hassey, Jack Beard and Scott Hassey here on the mic with the No Mulligans podcast, brought to you on the back porch of Franklin Bridge. And it feels like old times, man. I mean, the winter is great when we're in the studio, but uh, there's something about just like being out here on the porch with a green fairway in front of us, just talking some golf. Well, we've had a lot of rain too the last few days, which has really helped. Yeah, <laughs> a good bit. Yeah, um, it beats last summer. Like our first two weeks of junior camp were awful. It was so hot in June last oh year. Oh my god! Yeah, remember we went like 65 days without rain. I think it wasn't. It was like July, August. It was awful. Um, and that's when we uh, when the levels on the ponds went down and the fish oh, dude, the fish died it too. It smelled so bad over there. <laughs> you see all these. Like, why are there 27 hawks flying around in the air and yeah. vultures just yeah. picking off the fish, man? It was uh, not a good year to try and grow in some two new greens. but No, it wasn't. But at the same time, too, I mean, the course is in wonderful shape right now. Yep, turning around. Um, got a little repair work going on on the new number nine. Yep, yep. Uh, but it you is know what? nice to put on the old nine green, though. You know, like oh, having yeah. that actually be... A green for us. Yeah, and we got a new uh, bunker put in there. Yep, yep. So that'll open hopefully soon. I don't know when. Everybody keeps asking me, when's the green going to open? I don't know. Like, when it's time, when it's ready, when it's healed. Right. So, but It's you also going to give time for those uh, tee boxes, too, to mature. For us to have one green that's a little struggling, that's a brand new green. Yeah. It's only been in a little over a year. That's like. And other courses in the area are completely shut down and having to re mm -hmm. their greens. Yeah. I think we're doing a great job. I think so, too. And uh, we have Drive, Chip, and Putt tomorrow. So if you're listening to this podcast last week, we hosted Drive, Chip, and Putt. So not only will we have Drive, Chip, and Putt with all these kids here, we've got 27 kids in our Nike Junior Camp going at the same time. So this place will be full of kids. And we're hosting <laughs> the uh, the qualifier for the yes, USAM qualifier USM in July. Qualifier. So we have a nice, solid three weeks for things to really turn in our favor. Mm -hmm. So good weather. I mean, they, dude, the outside crew is killing it right now. If you guys see our, our supers, our outside crew, make sure to tell them thank you for everything because, I mean, this course with the winter freeze that j that happened this past winter, yep. uh, with the crazy heat that we had last year and to have, to have the course looking like this, I've said this to some of my friends. I said, you can go out on some fairways, like specifically I'm thinking number four right now. Yep. You can look straight down and not know if you're at Franklin Bridge or a private club right now. Yeah. And in some cases, we're better than some private clubs are right now. Yep. So, I mean, we are. Geez. We are. Thank you all so much. Uh, no, they've done a beautiful job. And there's a lot that people don't see. They see the one problem here and there, and they don't understand everything that's involved in trying oh to get God. it perfect. And most golf courses are only perfect, like in ideal conditions for like three to six weeks. If you get eight awesome weeks, you're yeah, – that's just super rare. And if you're watching crazy tournaments like, you know, Masters or U.S. Open that we just had, um, I mean – a lot of these PGA Tour courses take months, and they don't let any people play on them, and they they make sure that they are exactly perfect when that when that There's tour comes There's a lot of to limitations town. to how much play is allowed, and what right. where carts are permitted and not permitted, and right when they're permitted, and there's just a lot of rules that go into that. A so. lot of uh, and a lot of the landing popular landing areas in the fairway too. If you're playing one of those courses before a big tournament happens, they'll give you a square of turf. Oh, like a square of artificial turf for you to hit off of because they don't want you hitting in the landing areas. No, you got it right. I mean, that's welcome to primo conditions on the tour. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the tour. Okay. How about, like, I was hoping the finish of the U.S. Open was going to be a little more dramatic than it was. Like, Ricky Fowler just kind of fell apart there early and just never was able to get it back. Scotty never turned it on. And it was just kind of this, like, steady, even par round of golf. You're just more looking for uh, for guys to fall apart, and they just didn't. Yeah, I mean, props to Wyndham for playing how he did on Sunday. Um, once LACC really dried out on the weekend, you could really start to see why this was a U.S. Open course. Um, and I agree. You know, on Thursday and Friday, really when Ricky made the majority of his birdies – 
you know, that's when they were saying that the conditions were a little bit better for lower rounds. And so Ricky just got off to a really hot start. And I guess when the, the conditions changed over Saturday and Sunday, just kind of couldn't put it together, man. Brooks and I uh, were talking via text. Um, not Brooks Kepka for those who are listening. Our owner, Brooks. Um, but we were texting back and forth about, um, and then he said something I hadn't thought about. He said, it's really interesting. I don't remember a tournament where guys made that many birdies and bogeys. Like it was like birdie, birdie, bogey. Par, Nobody had birdie, a clean card. Yeah. Bogey, birdie, birdie, yeah, bogey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was like, what is going on? A guy to make like seven or eight birdies and make six bogeys and yep. shoot two under. You're yep, like, yep, yep. What? 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 Uh, what how? Like, and so. That's one, like, I hate when the tour does this, and they do it at the U.S. Open every year. You know I have no data on the U.S. Open ever. Oh, because they don't have – They don't post the, They don't post, any, they don't data, post yeah. any of the data for it. So I can't see where the balls were placed and all that. I got to see the greens books. I could see pole locations. But uh, – <clears throat> so I have no data from any U.S. Opens. You think that's intentional? I want to look at that. I think so. I think there's something – I don't know why. I, I don't – the fact that it's one of the only tournaments. Now, I'll also see that in match play events because it's just practically for match play. Guys, are, like, they get given shots or they give the whole, so yeah. like, it doesn't make sense for them to track it there. I think they're tracking it at the U.S. Open, but I don't, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I keep playing with my cable. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but that's the, that's the tricky part for me. It's like, I, don't, I don't know why they do it. I think I got it. Nope. Nope. Here, hold on. Switch mics with me. We better? Yeah, I think. Will that work? Okay, this could be different. Okay. <laughs> Te technical difficulties? All right, Tate's got it. Uh, so where are we going with this? So, uh, so no. Nope. We're going to get a different on. cable. And here, I'm going to say my point while Tate's fixing here. All right, I switched over to the other mic. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. The, um, the I'm just going to call it a dirty card, if you will. Like, it was, it, you're right. It, it's, it was birdie, bogey, birdie, 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 bogey, bogey, birdie, bogey. And it was so funny watching the cards as, you know, they would somebody would finish a hole and their card would pop up on the screen. And I'm just like... There's too many shapes on this on this card. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. I just think that that's um I I I like that. If you really want my take on it, I like that as a US Open uh as a as a US Open course. I think everybody on the early part of the tournament on um Scott's testing his microphone. Maybe. Oh, oh there we go. That's nice. Way better. Okay. Hello. So, um bad cable, huh? I like a course that changes, like the conditions change over the course of a weekend. I like that. I think that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge of a U.S. Open course. The greens, super severe, super, super quick, super firm. It was, a, it was a joy to watch these guys miss in the right places. And if you see Wyndham, uh, and they were talking about this all week, in his last round, I think he hit close to every fairway. Maybe yeah. it was like... Something it was something crazy. I think it was like thirteen fairways. Yeah, and he was super steady the whole that whole day. Which Just is like really didn't miss a shot. Yeah. Played super steady. Uh didn't do anything flashy, didn't right. do anything really bad. You know, they all had a couple of bad shots in there and um it, to me that's what I don't mind a major championship guys finishing over par. I mean people are like they just make it as hard as no. possible. It's like, well, yeah, I mean no, no. I part of making a that. golf course super hard is you want to see who's playing the best that week, not just – and who's mentally the toughest that week, who's physically in the best shape that week. Yes. Who's strategically the best. Like, all of the pieces, the reason for a major championship to be really hard is for that. And when they're really hard, you see a lot of changes in that leaderboard and fluctuations. If a guy can get on a string of maybe – you know, really play it well for a few holes, you can see that leaderboard just whoa. Flip. The U.S. Open is my favorite major by far. Yeah. I like that it's difficult. And uh, when the British Open, when the conditions get really bad, that's a really fun one to watch too because it gets – Yeah. <laughs> like the conditions how can would make you, it uh, wild. How would you rank majors, favorite to least favorite? 
Mine would be U.S. Open. PGA Masters, Championship is dead last. Yeah, Masters Open Championship is my third. Just because I'm not a huge fan of like watching that like mm. that kind of style of golf, but that's just me personally. I th- I think, but I like the challenge, which is why it's third yeah, and not last. Yeah, I. <laughs> so this is gonna sound weird. I actually would put the players, even though it's like not an official major. That's what everybody says. Yeah, I would put I the players at. I would go. I want to say Augusta first because I've been there, but I'd love to go to a British Open or an open championship, if you will, and get that taste. Because I feel like I would flip my role because of how much, like, the original, authentic design, the old school designs that I yeah. love, yeah. I think that would move the open championship to number one for me. Augusta two. Uh, U.S. Open US three. U.S. Open three. PGA. PGA. And I would I would put the players ahead of the PGA. Yeah. Yeah, I like just that. Just personal preference. It doesn't yeah. make it like it's a. They play a lot of similarities in terms of golf courses as the U.S. Open, so it kind of feels like, like the U.S. Open's redheaded stepchild a little bit. Like it's just like, it kind of tries to be the U.S. Open, but it's not. What did you think about LACC being a U.S. Open course? Um. By the way, while, I, sorry, I'm gonna cut you off right you're here. Good. Go ahead. Um read something crazy the land and a, a lot of you probably saw it but the land that lacc sits on it is valued at oh, over eight billion dollars oh, i saw this and because they have a loophole in there wh- which by the in way the that eight, that eight billion is uh it's the second most expensive assessed land behind um central park new york city yeah, it's ridiculous how expensive that is. And their their tax loophole makes their um makes their taxes and, like and twenty the, million and instead of eighty. And the tax loophole is for multiple other entities, not just for golf correct, courses. Correct, There's correct, a lot correct. of other places, but yeah, the golf courses get. So little background on LACC there. Now, do you think it was a good Open Championship course? Or U.S. Open I think course, any me? I think any time you take away a lot of the spectator possibilities, you lose you lose some of the excitement. Completely agree. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, I think the course allotted like, was it 90,000 tickets or something like that? I don't know what the number was. uh, 70,000 of those 90 were for corporate sponsors and, you know, big guns. And then 20 was released to the general public. So like, for instance, for instance, like, I think, there are golf courses out there that will never host a major championship and could and should, mm-hmm. partly because there's no place to put spectators. There's not like a great from as I was reading more. It doesn't sound like there's a great place to put spectators either, mm. even if you had it. Mm. Mm. It's so it's like where do you put them? They're probably having to like multiple holes are probably blocked off so you can only see like edges. So it may not even be a great spectator golf course yeah um and so like pine valley is one that i played in new jersey and it's hmm. regularly ranked in the top five and has been number one in the world for a huge number of years it's super exclusive kind of like lacc and (coughs) it's so to get for me to get to play it is phenomenal but like there's no place to put a gallery like where are you going to put them in in order to put a gallery out there you'd have to destroy what makes it makes it pine valley like yeah and i guess to uh to to add on top of that point when they had the u.s open uh at pebble what was that two years ago last year no two years ago um they completely took out the entire driving range and put grandstands on it and they took out part of their north course they merged two fairways together to make the driving range for the players and so i think you're getting uh, a case here where lacc didn't want to tear up their spot and probably didn't have any of the space either when you look at lacc from above it's just a giant rectangle and the course sits all of it so you might be on to something when you're talking about spectators like another place would be country club of birmingham the west course is a tournament golf course it's 7400 yards super difficult multiple undulating greens narrow as all get out Um, you could host spectators, but like where it's located, 
where are you going to put the tour vans and the tour trucks? Like you would still have a driving range, but you'd have to put all of those on the other golf course. Mm. And so you'd ruin like, wow. No, think you, about that. You wouldn't even like, it yeah. would take months, if not a year or more to get it back in a playable condition yeah. on that other side. So yeah. sometimes places just like, they're just, it's not feasible to get, all the things that are necessary to play there. So, you know, that's the, I that's think the, the challenge of that. Two, if I can pivot from this a little bit from LACC, because I think the course is always a big uh, deal when we're talking about U.S. Opens. But you hit on something earlier when you were talking about U.S. Open courses and why you have to be the best when you're there. And you mentioned, uh, can you mention those things again? Because you said you gotta, you've got to stay physically strong. You have to stay mentally tough. You have to be in shape. And was there another one? So, so I think it's, you're, you have to be playing well. Yep. You have to, your physique and your food intake, your rest, like all your yep. just like general health stuff has to be in shape. You have to strategically play at best, and then you have to be mentally the toughest. And, you know, mental toughness looks different for different people. You know, Ricky's trying to make a massive comeback from way down on the world rankings. Wyndham Clark's made a comeback, and there you've got Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler breathing fire down your neck. Um, it's just like Scotty's never going away. Like he's inside the top ten like every week right yeah. now. And it's ridiculous. So, I just think that that's super that's super important because that's why I think people love U.S. Opens is just because you're going to see the best of the best in their prime in that like in in game mode. Like you're not yeah. gonna you're not gonna get a guy slacking who's playing no. on Sunday. <clears throat> and you know it's it's really neat. Like this is one of the things that makes golf golf, and this happens in other sports too. But like. Golf, it's more obvious and it's more out there. You know, everybody's wanting Ricky to win. Like, he's obviously the favorite in that moment, like, to see him, like, this epic comeback. And then you've got Wyndham. Like, his mom passed away not too long ago. And so he's trying to come back from that. And so, like, you've got both of them, two major underdogs, like, finally getting a chance and then for Wyndham to win and Ricky to reno lean over and first thing he says to him is like your mom would be proud of you. you yeah. know, I'm happy for you. Really cool. And Wyndham's like, this is yours next year. Like yeah. there's like you see that maybe after the game a lot in the other sports, but golf it's just like constant through the whole thing. Mm. Like there's a general support of one another and the tour tries to like media tries to pit these guys more against each other than is really there. And so it's nice yeah. to see that again afresh, especially with all the live and PGA Tour stuff. That was a nice way to kind of squash on a week of chaos to be followed by a week of like, let's come together on something and yeah. And I mean, together. I think what people forget too is like this is the PGA Tour, like it is a tour of the world's best players, right? So. I think that you can get caught up in all the, like, it's me versus you kind of deal. But at the same time, too, these guys are seeing each other week after week together, all, like, throughout the entire, like, traveling together, it's being like away from their families. It is a fraternity, right? Yeah. And so it's like yeah. those guys are just able to turn it off and on all the time. And, I mean, everybody's different. But I feel like you guys, you see guys like, you know, I mean, Tiger's a drastic example because he's made a huge comeback and done really well about this over the last, but he's able to be in game mode and also, you know, turn it off and, and be a, a bro. <laughs> well, <laughs> For lack and, you know, of a better I, term. I sit here and think, as I was thinking about this last week and I've had some good interactions with kids and their families and parents and I've had some not great interactions and like, that's pretty much a normal week, <laughs> right? It's like, you have really good ones. You have bad ones. You have parents that are trying really hard and making it worse. You have parents that aren't trying at all and making it worse. You have parents that are trying hard and making it better. Uh, there's kind of this, there's just a ton of mix there, right? And so to see, like, Wyndham's really close <clears throat> with his mom, obviously, right? Yeah. Like, and every kid has a parent that they connect with more, and some don't connect with either parents, right? If there's some sort of trauma built in. But, like, <clears throat> these two guys, to be mentally tough means to have all the back-of-the-house stuff secure. You can't play well out there and the back be in shambles. Like Michael mm. Block at the PGA Championship, he said, yeah. when like his relationship with his wife and his kids is good, his relationship and his work is good, his finances are under control. He's like the hole just looks really big, and he, that's like there's a certain amount of that that's so true. Like 
when your back of the house is taken care of, the front of the house is great. And so, like, this healing process that Wyndham's been going through and Ricky's still going through, and I think he meant it when he said, hey, you know what? Like, I'm not afraid of losing. Like, I've come to terms with that. Like, that's fine. It's so <clears> interesting because there was I don't a, think he's a giving up either. Like, just, no. just being, like, his relationship with failure is really yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, that's so interesting that you mentioned that, too, because, um, you know, I've been playing some of my best golf over the past couple months. And uh, it just feels like over the past couple weeks, like, I just, I, I, I can't find it right now. Well, Yeah. Yeah, and There's just me asking you the question at the start of the podcast the third time tonight. I was like, "So how are you doing, really? Yeah, like how are you really doing? I know, I know, right? But yeah, it's just interesting how um, you know. And I was work. I'm a real estate agent, so I was out here. I was lucky enough to have a few hours, so I came out here and played nine. And um, I was just on my phone, like working a little bit. Some work came in, and I was just working on it. And then as soon as like the golf game just dropped like that. Yeah, because that that isn't secure it doesn't mean it's bad right it's just like your head somewhere else right yeah. and so to be in the place that you're in it is a challenge and so yeah guys typically and girls go through struggles and successes as the life goes through ebbs and flows right and 100%, so the yeah. goal is to try to ride those highs when they're good mm -hmm. and try to mitigate manage the lows that, manage the lows and just yeah. try and stay above them which is why uh <laughs> for those of you who kind of like well what are they going to talk about tonight we are we're really talking about we want to talk about performance right right and so i think that's why the u.s open is a big topic because that's the one that you have to perform in and perform in all of the ways that you might be able to get away with on some other weekends on the tour right, right. The, on some of the easier golf courses your game is strong enough right at its weakest. At its weakest, mentally, physically, contend, strategically, yeah. where you're just not all the way there, to still kind of hang in there and make some cuts, make some money, and keep going, right? Which is the reason, too, why you'll see the best in the world, you know, like Tiger, like Scotty, like Rom, like Brooks when he's playing well. You'll just see, like, these guys just are on it. Like, they're just different guys. They're different players, right? It's mm -hmm. because they're not having to – they're so good that they don't have to exert full energy. And just because they have a lot of money doesn't mean they have a, don't have stress. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Let's you know, not, it's I like, mean, oh, they're famous. They're you really watch Brooks like, Kepka on the on the full swing documentary, right? That man is – before that, when that was filmed, he had won four majors, right? Dude's has, in shambles. He has plenty of money. And you see him in the full swing in his mansion with his, like, sick – backyard and pool and he's like he's like he's fine like that that man could live five lifetimes and be fine but you see yeah. him stressed out and depressed and right. all that kind of stuff like money's not everything as we all know right it's like they're all humans too like they yeah. have they have lives outside of it like think about it like in order for you to do anything that's enjoyable like he can't just go like you and i can you know run down to one of the local restaurants even one of the nicer restaurants we can go down to and be Totally us. Just hang out. You can't do that. Like, right. so recognizable. You go there, and that's your life. You go and show up at this tournament, and you got everybody's wanting an autograph, and you got this, and you got, like, everybody's pulling at you. And you're just trying to go play the best rounds you can, and you're trying to get ready for the tournament. You got to play a pro man and talk all these people. Like, there's just so much stress, and you got to travel, and you got new time zones and new food. and That's why you have to, which I think this is an essential skill in performing well in life, performing well in a sport, performing well professionally. You have to increase your mental capacity. Oh, I agree a thousand, and thousandfold. There was a, um, when I first got into real estate, I remember this very clearly, my... Um, one of my mentors, he was like, you're going to, you're going to get to a point where you're handling like five, six, seven clients at a time. And you're going to think it's nothing. And I was sitting there with like one client being like, I can't take any more appointments. Like I can't do it. I can't do anything. Like I've got to, I've got to take these guys, take care of them. And sure enough, I mean, now I'm running two businesses. I'm trying to take on more clients, like trying to get like my, my capacity has increased. Correct. And how I relate that back to golf is when you have these major superstars like a Brooks Kepka, he's got so much going on in his life, and he, he's at capacity, and he's just like, everybody stop. Like, I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to have yeah. a moment for myself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what happened with Brooks, and it just took took him a bit where he was like, I'm just taking the live money, and it, honestly, it probably wasn't even the money for Brooks. I bet the, the money was super appealing, but I bet he was like, I get to play less, I, I, need I get break. to play fun golf. Right. I don't have to worry about being the best, right? right. And then right. you see him come back, and in the first major he plays in, gets second place in the Masters, and then goes out and wins. So uh, 
Gives out the wins of PGA. This is something I think I underestimated is by going to live, the thing that they did was they pulled all of their stressors off. Yes, 100%. It's not the money. That's the key. And so when the stressors fell off, even though maybe the short term they didn't play as well, the long term they were able to like enter this kind of recovery phase where it was probably therapy for a lot of them. Right. <laughs> right. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, no, I just like, need to get on par threes and hear Kodak Black playing on the uh, <laughs> on the tee box while I'm teeing yeah. off. Well, and so <laughs> and so like one of the challenges I was dialoguing with um, uh, RSA, I was dialoguing yeah. with with Mary and Tanya. And it's like there seems to be this gap in performance. There's either really, really good or like bottom tier. There's not much in the middle. And that makes a lot of sense. Like, well, all the good players, they all run over here and like it's the business of sport and like that's not good. I was like, but the best are always going to congregate to the best. They are going to, they're, they have to. Like in order to become the best, you cannot have people that are pulling you into holes regardless of whether that's financial related or mentally related. And generally speaking, people that are poor have a different mindset than people that have more. And – Poor can be financially, it can be emotionally, it can be mentally, it can be all that. Right. So, like, there's a lot of different ways in which people are poor. There are people who have a lot of trauma that haven't dealt with it well. There are people with a lot of trauma who've dealt with it well. Like, so your high performers are going to hang around them. They're not going to hang around the weak. So, like, they're going to congregate. And so that's where the personal responsibility component comes in. And then you have parents that are adding stress to their kids. This is probably my least favorite one. And so... Like we talked about when your finances are under control, when you're all these things, like the whole looks bigger. How does that look for a kid, right? So like <clears throat> for a child, it's like, how are my relationships with my key people? Well, who are the main key people in any child's life? I don't care if they're still in high school and they're like, I want out of house. It's with their parents. Like that's the fundamental relationship. If that one's secure, they can then learn how to build secure relationships elsewhere. So that was one I had a wonderful dialogue with parents, right? So if that one's not secure, then you don't learn how to do the other ones well. Um, and you need at least one of those parent relationships to be secure in order to be able to continue to go forward. But is like I had two parents that reach out, like how do we help our uh, help our child, right? Not even say whether it's a guy or a girl, right? How do we help our child? Like what can we do better? And I was like, honestly, you just need to put them on an island. Let them be on an island, stay away, stay out of it, totally out of it. If they tank, they tank, continue to provide the support that they need. Like, that's the way it is. And one of the things over dialoguing over time, <clears throat> as I sat down, I got to sit with them this last week here on the back patio together. And I'm dialoguing with the child back and forth over text over the course of several weeks. And they're conversing with me. Like, so I'm working these two separate relationships I'm working the parents with me and the child with me so I can bring them together. And so like helping the parents see there's a, there's a moment of trauma that you created in the child. It's nothing severe, nothing major, right? But it was significant. When the child was in need of help, you weren't there, right? And so the child's learned to push you away and you aren't a source of support. And then when they don't look like they're working as hard and they're not working as hard because they're discouraged, and because they feel this added pressure on them. And this is the one that comes out. And this is the one that the child said to me and said, like, it really bothers me. And I let them say it to the parent. When you threaten to take away the things that you've just freely given to me, like I'm trying, I'm not trying to like, do I make mistakes and do I not work as hard? Yeah, but I'm not working as hard because I'm discouraged and I can't talk to you. And so then I go sit on my social media and I go hang out with my friends and I don't practice as much because that's what feels good. Like I'm licking the wound rather than they can't go to the parent. And so to see the parents connect with that and to see them move towards each other was tremendous. So for a child, the financial security is not having the pressure from the parents to perform. And so I flipped the script this way. I said, look, I hate bringing up these types of things, but it helps make sense of the situation. I said, you're actually threatening taking away the thing that you've freely given them, which is you provide your kids opportunity. Yeah, I'd love to provide my kid opportunity. What if something really bad happened to your child? What would you give up? It wouldn't matter the cost. 
you do it, right? Give them the opportunity. They're here in front of, I have an awesome team around me. Like, and I consider the podcast as a part of my team, right? We have a wonderful resource. And so it's like, what are you doing as a parent that's not creating a safe space for your child to come and talk to you? Guess what? Sometimes they just play bad. They're trying. Are there certain personality traits about them that don't work well? Yeah. But let me coach that. They just need you to be there. And when all you do is give them praise for when they do well and give them barely encouragement or like backhanded encouragement when they're doing poorly, they think in order to be loved is to perform. And in reality, if the worst thing happened to them in the world that you can imagine in your head as a parent, none of that would matter, right? So like we need to take that same application to sport, to scholastics, to relationships with their peers, boyfriends, girlfriends, like we need to be there and to support them. And like, I'm already seeing my own flaws as a parent. And I need somebody to help my kids one day walk through the ways in which I messed it up. You know, what's so interesting is that um, I'm sitting here while you while you went on that. Great, by the way. No, no, no. Don't apologize for it. It was great. But I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, you know, professional athletes come in all shapes and sizes, right? I'm just thinking here about baseball. The College World Series is on and a lot of those guys will go and be pro. And uh, I'm just looking at professional sports. All, all run the gamut of the four major sports in the United States. They come in all shapes and sizes, right? What separates those people from us or the regulars, per se? It's it's the mindset. It's the Absolutely. headspace. It's the discipline. Right. It's all of that. It's what's, it's what's between the ears, not right. necessarily what you're given, right? So you see some people, I mean, in professional baseball, you see some people who are uh, – you know, shorter and wider and they are hall of famers and some people who are tall and skinny and uh, all in between dude. And so I guess what I'm trying to say here is the mindset and the head space is the only thing that differentiates elite people in their field and anybody else. The mindset allows them to push themselves to the place that they need to correct push. and have fun doing it and have a healthy right. relationship w- with whatever they're good at. And that's really hard. Y- very hard. I mean, there's a reason why the people out there are professionals and we're not. So here's, this is super profound out of a, the mouth of an almost seven-year-old. I had my son at uh, Nike camp last week with our juniors. So it's three hours. <clears throat> I only see him for like 45 minutes to an hour of it because we rotate. And I asked him on the last day as we're walking back to putting. <laughs> and I said, Daniel, are you having fun with golf camp? And he said, yeah, I love the obstacle course. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> what <laughs> like we have obstacle courses like that's fine they have fun with it it didn't even say anything about the golf it was about i had fun engaging with the game and some new friends that he got to meet oh my and god like, yeah, i love that and so what like i'm having to learn how to have fun again and i think parents like i think being a parent helps you learn how to do that and how to enjoy things like Part of performance, and this is the always the last principle of my teaching philosophy, but it's kind of the foundation of it, is you have to improve the whole person to maximize performance. Like, this is why I've had counselors tell me, like, you sure you don't want to be a psychologist or a counselor? I was like, no, nah, because I'm not life on life. Like, this is life on life, right? And so to sit here with these parents and the kid and to begin to bond the two of them together where they can have a solid relationship going forward because I know that that relationship being strong allows the relationship with coaches, teammates, spouses. Like I know that that builds on all of that and that's what frees up the performance to be good because everything else is secure. So I can just go and play, enjoy the game, enjoy learning. And like kids at, kids and adults that freak out when they hit a bad shot is because something else isn't secure. Yeah. Something else is in danger. Something else is threatening. It's like we have to deal with that. So we just throw more money at it, throw more practice at it, and like it just gets bigger and worse. And in the same sense, too, if I can relate this not necessarily to kids in development but to like a higher level of sport, a lot of the people who play at a high level, and I can certainly say this, too, just from just playing high school and just a tad bit of college, it's just like – my favorite moments of my sport are hanging out with my teammates and my good coaches yeah. and having a healthy relationship with the sport that's not necessarily playing the sport all the time, right? Yep. Sometimes the best part of it is just having fun and not necessarily performing. And now performing keeps you in the game, and it's essentially what's fun. And if I, don't, I think if, you're, if you don't love winning, you're probably not going to be a professional at anything. Right. But just 
those other things that people don't think about. It's not just about playing the sport at a high level. If you don't have a good relationship with the sport at a high level, you're missing the whole point. Yeah. And you might be successful. You can be successful and not have a healthy relationship with the thing because you work hard enough to be able to. Or you have a you have uh, you're good at it because you have a successfully a successfully unhealthy relationship with the sport. And so a the successful qu- unhealthy right. relationship so with this, the sport. So this this yeah. brings up the question: What is performance? What does it mean to perform well? Mm, and mm. I think one of the things we've lost is like a good name matters more than it should anyway matters more than winning the house the the car the tournament the moving up in the corporate ladder like we make all those things matter but they really at the end of the day we just keep chasing the next one yeah and what you get to see out of ricky and Wyndham this week and i got to see out of this relationship with this parent child here is <clears throat> you get to see that those are the things that lead to exceptional performance. Sure. Because and, you've taken care of the business at home. Right. Yep. And so when you take care of that, things go well. And it's it's um, it's hard to realize that. And, and parents have an important role. And bosses have an important mm-hmm. role. And spouses have an important role. And, like, where are your relationships? So you always like to ask the question, like, so what's the take home for families? I think it's twofold. If you're a parent with a child that's playing, first and foremost, just stop. Call a timeout. And if you want to know how you're doing with your child, call me, call Elijah, call Erica. We'll tell you. Like, If you want an honest answer, like tell us what what you need to do, we'll tell you. Because we hear it, right? We hear when it's good. We hear when it's bad. And do I take everything a kid says with, you know, full truth? No. But I also I also don't do the same with a parent. I don't do right? the same with anybody, yeah. So, you know, is take an honest look. Like, you have a role in creating the thing that it is that's happening. My job is to help them take ownership of what their role is in perpetuating maybe the negative relationship because relationships always have two sides, right? There's two people, and they're becoming young adults. The other one is, like, <clears throat> take stock of everything else in your life if you're just an adult playing the game. Or you're a kid playing the game. That's fine. Like, if you're a player, take stock of, like, I would go this way. Anyone. How, how, yeah, is, anyone. how is faith and family, depending on if those are a priority in your life or not, like, family's got to be secure or in your faith. Like, those two things have to be Trump top two. How am I doing with my physical health? Then it goes into work, other friendships, like, It starts at the top, and then it moves down through the chain. Take stock. Rate those. Is there one that's weak? What can you do about it? Is this something you just need to manage? You're in a bad job. You're in a hard season of life. Is there ways you can tighten that down? Because if you can get that tightened down, then you can come and enjoy the game. You can enjoy learning. And the the kid that was here, to get a text back from him going, having fun playing again. Having fun learning and trying new shots and trying new things. And they're currently five shots lower than they were six weeks ago in their scoring average. Right? And it's because we're doing the hard, deep work. Like, I was in a text thread with this kid till 1130 at night. It started at, like, 10 o'clock. And we were doing some deep heart soul work. And, dude, I was like, keep going. I just keep asking questions. Like, we're almost to the root of the reason why they're so frustrated and struggling with performance. And we got there, and because we got there, we could sit down and have the conversation here. So take stock of it. Ask your, like, who do you trust? Like, yeah. I that's mean, why I asked you before we started, like, how yeah. are you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of asked me the same question, too. Like, how are you really doing? I'm like, man, this is heavy right now. This yeah, yeah. Busy season. Yeah, it's also interesting because. You know, naturally, when priorities arise, you got to take care of them, right? So, a lot of the times, unless you are Brooks Kepka, like golf is not going to be a priority <laughs> for you, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think all of that really resonated with me, and how I know this is going to resonate with other people is because while you were talking, it resonated with me, <laughs> yeah. and it brought up reasons why, like, for example, I shot, uh, I shot an eighty-five 
the last time I played 18. Yeah. And I was so upset with it. I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> like, I hit three tee balls out of bounds. And I'm like, what, what's going on? Like, I, and I just, right. the, the headspace wasn't there. I just feel like I was clawing back every single time, like just trying to scramble, right? And luckily, that's and there's value in that. Yeah, there's so right? much value in that. There's, but there's mental toughness. It's built. Yeah, I just it, it's also uh, you know stressful too when you're just like, hey man, like this is a goal you need to shoot for, and I need to remember that it's a goal. It's an aspiration. It's right. it's something that I need to accept, right? I need to accept a new normal, right, of shooting right. well, but I also need to have a good relationship and realizing that, dude, input that number into your gin, you know, G- into your gin app. Like you did it, and that's what you got to do, and then it's going to be that much more satisfying when you come out here and shoot a 72 next time, you know? Right. So, and just recognizing all of the other things that were going on in my life, work, yeah. personal, that kind of stuff. So interesting how actually that does have a correlation, and it's related with me very, very recently. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. What's the stock? Like what does it mean to perform – and I think taking care of the things that matters is matters more. Yep. And because of that, both Wyndham and Ricky can walk away from that tournament with their heads held high. One holds the trophy, but like both those guys have a tremendous amount to be proud of. Rory, Scotty, I mean, here's wonderful tournament. My big takeaway from this. This is my this is my end end cap here. Yeah, I'll stop here. Yeah, what, I'm what a change! I have nothing else to say. No, no. Here's where I'll stop. Is is I'll just say that uh, when I first when we first started talking about this episode, we were talking about the U.S. Open, right? And I was like, I was kind of expecting us to talk about you know performance when it relates to golf, what we need to be doing, how we need to be doing it, how to level up as a player. And then you took it into this direction, and everything just clicked with me. I was like, holy cow! Like this is, you're right. You need to have your business taken care of before you hit the before you you hit the links, just because. I mean, your brain's going to be in a different place. So I love all that. love all that. And I hope uh, all of y'all listening got a lot out of that too. So thank y'all so much for listening to this episode of the No Mulligans podcast. It's Scott and Jack. Scott, you can uh, follow him on Instagram at Golf. Uh, we posted today saying that the podcast is going to be out here on the back porch of Franklin Bridge. Unfortunately, we got some rainfall today, so uh, not a lot of people ended up coming out to play golf. Um, but we do have some people out here in the audience listening, so appreciate you guys for coming out. Always remember to uh, follow us. We've got a TikTok now. We need to start putting out a TikTok. No Mulligans Pod, I believe, is the name for that one. So uh, we'll be putting out some stuff. Scott swing videos. I'll put some of my swing videos on that. We'll post some of our tips and tricks uh, and some clips from the podcast too. So thank y'all so much. Uh, Remember on YouTube, no mulligans podcast and on Apple music and Spotify, no mulligans. So from Scott and Jack on the back porch of the Franklin bridge, the Franklin bridge. We'll see you on the next one. Peace.